A very good day, ladies and gentlemen of the media and fellow Guyanese. It's certainly a privilege to be able to host our first press conference from the Ministry of Public Works since assuming office. Joining me Today is Minister within the Ministry of Public Works, Mr. Diodat Indar. We propose to do two things today. Give you an indication of what we met and the state of affairs on arrival at the Ministry and to also indicate to you actions that have been taken and to apprise you of initiatives that are being undertaken by the Irfan Ali administration where we have been tasked at the Ministry of Public Works to be the lead. We commenced work on August 6th, having been sworn into office on August 5th. We met with the heads of all departments within the ministry, and then we met with the heads of all of the agencies that fall under our supervision and policy direction. The Ghana Civil Aviation Authority, I believe it's one of the agencies that most Guyanese at home and abroad are currently very interested in, more particularly since COVID-19. And out of the engagements with the Director General of the Civil Aviation Authority, we have been able to resolve the issue of late or delayed flight approvals so Guyanese could know way ahead of time in the absence of continuous commercial operation when flights are available inbound and outbound. Today I'm happy to announce that flights have been approved for the months of September and October by Eastern Airlines. This will be charter flights for September and for October. Civil Aviation Authority will publish the dates so that all interested parties could be aware and these are flights for New York and Miami as it relates to flights to Toronto Canada that is a work in progress as of noon the latest communication that I have is that engagements with WestJet and Caribbean Airlines are ongoing to ensure a similar type arrangement uh, to be put in place for chartered flights at specified times, observing all of the COVID-19 protocols both locally and internationally can be adhered to. So there is flight approvals all of September, dates in September, 
and dates in October. The Civil Aviation Authority continues to provide regulatory advice and instructions and to ensure that in this period of COVID-19, both inbound and outbound flights are in full compliance. We are currently exploring the possibility of the acquisition of mist tunnels that will allow for sanitization on arrival and departure where needs be. Port de Chedijagan International Airport and the GCAA are pursuing the options because we want to ensure at the appropriate time all the standards that are required for the full reopening of the airport are met and that we are in full compliance. The Transport and Harbors Department continues to operate its services into the Northwest Antarctica and to Region 2, Supernam, Leguan, and Wakenam. And based upon interventions from us as ministers within this sector, they have been renewed and revised more frequent arrangements so that the backlog and the backup of trucks with goods and people to be moved into the various areas are being remedied. The Transport and Harbors Department have been instructed to publish and to ensure that the public is fully aware of their schedules. As of last night, I approved, along with the Minister of Health, who is ultimately responsible for this, despite of the restrictions into Region 7, the ferry to Bartica departed this morning and there will be another departure on Friday to ensure that goods and supplies are not cut off even though there is a lockdown in those communities because of the rising cases. The Transport and Harbors Department have been instructed to ensure that there is full compliance with all of the safety regulations. Passengers departed Northwest uh, last week, and we would like to facilitate another trip in the shortest possible time, provided that all of the guidelines are followed. Ladies and gentlemen, hinterland electrification is being has been uh, pre-2015 a priority for the PPPC administration and 2020 in this Irfan Ali's administration it is also a priority but I'm saddened to report to the nation that when we arrived at the Ministry of Public Works the seven areas that are to be served by generated power in the hinterland electricity program, those generators have not been adequately maintained and serviced. And there was an immediate request for $281 million, almost $282 million, to carry out much needed repairs to these generators. There was a lack of proper maintenance, and as a result, 
Electricity at Matthews Ridge was down for several months. Last night, I checked personally with residents in Matthews Ridge who have reported receiving power because the generators are up and running because of interventions that were made. But we are expressing concern that the communities of Madia and Letem and Port Kaituma and Mabaruma could experience difficulties because of the lack of proper maintenance of these gen sets. This is something that the ministry will have to pursue almost immediately. But like I said, the day that we arrived, there was that request for $281 million to carry out this particular operation. The government of Guyana, being led by President Irfan Ali, continues to pursue renewable energy initiatives and one of the programs that was in the ministry and not really moving uh, in a manner that we would have expected because we have complained about the incompetence and the mismanagement and maladministration that occurred, the president has since engaged the Hind Indian High Commissioner and very shortly the final program will be announced because it is currently being designed where we can see household solar units, possibly 20 to 25,000 being procured, which will speak to an upgrade from 65 watts to 100 watts for our brothers and sisters in hinterland communities. And this is a project that is being uh, accelerated based upon discussions and decision-making engaging the His Excellency the President and His Excellency the Indian High Commission along with myself and Minister Indar who have been working to ensure we get that moving. The Cherijagan International Airport continues to be a matter of great concern to all Guyanese. And speaking to this matter, it's not a new issue. Now that we are in government, we have a better understanding of what has transpired 2015, 2020, as it relates to the implementation of the Cherry Jagan airport modernization program. Sadly, what was designed, signed, and expected to be delivered is not what the Guyanese people are receiving. And even in the reformulated, remodeled, downsized, Re renovated program as against having an airport with a new terminal building with eight passenger air bridges or with the capacity to accommodate eight aircraft at one time is not yet a reality. The runaway is incomplete. Works are going on at both ends. The terminal building that was renovated have significant defects. Leaking roofs, improper tiling, problems with air conditioning, lighting, and the list of woes continue. But I guess of greater interest 
to all of us is the fact that passengers inbound and outbound still have to walk on the tarmac because the four air bridges or passenger boarding bridges that are there are dysfunctional and malfunctioning. You will recall that in the original design that the PPPC would have presented to the nation by way of documentation, this airport was designed for eight air bridges. In the remodeled, reformulated Granger administration plan, the contractor was only required to provide two air bridges. The Granger administration came to the parliament for supplementary provisions, which is additional monies beyond the contract sum, to purchase two additional air bridges. So they were supposed to have four air bridges. As we sit here today, they are not functioning. So the airport, which was supposed to be modernized, allowing during the, uh, the time of rainfall or weather patterns that could affect passengers' safety, they are still having to walk on the tarmac to board and to discharge from the aircraft. This project is also very troubled. The briefs from the project engineer, one of our young, intelligent, hardworking Guyanese, and, she's a, and, and, and it's a woman, have indicated that there is effort being made by that project engineer to get the contractor to comply with terms and conditions of the contract and to deliver what was signed on to. It's not happening. It's not happening. As a matter of fact, the contract for the completion of this airport, even in its extended versions, because this was extended several times, expired 31st of December 2018. And currently, almost two years after, there is no significant work being done by the contractor to comply and to complete this project. Very shortly, the Ministry of Public Works, having been briefed by our representatives in the person of the project engineer and the consultant who is supervising the works, will be engaging the contractor on the way forward. We are in a period of liquidated damages, almost, or I should say, over 700 days uh, that have elapsed, and I don't even think there is sufficient monies in the remaining contract based upon the calculations to really benefit from liquidated damages. But not just to say, the, P the PPPC Air Finale's administration, we are committed towards the completion of the modernization of the Chedi Jagan International Airport. And every effort is being made to ensure the contractor complies and all that needs to be done will be done to ensure that we have a product that the Guyanese people can surely benefit from. There are some other issues that I want to bring to your attention. As it relates to our sea defenses, or sea and river defenses, we have a major breach in the Maikoni area, 
the Danzig Maikoni area, which started out as a 200 meter bridge. God knows what transpired as it relates to the management of sealing that breach and a two meter, 200 meter breach ended up being five kilometers plus. And as of yesterday morning, there was an additional breach in the very same area of more than a hundred meters. Residents in the community are currently flooded. Farmers, poultry rearers, and other businesses and families are severely affected. As of yesterday afternoon, and just before I came to this press conference, we have engaged the permanent secretary of the ministry and the other technical officers to arrange for emergency works to be done and to ensure that financing from whatever is available outside of a budget can be utilized to bring relief to the people of that community. Minister Indar, the very day after we assumed government, visited that area. So for the questions on this matter, he will be able to answer. But the financing and the emergency works I have approved so the people of that community can have immediate relief. Leguan Stelling, colleagues, this is a project that is really cause for great concern. I have engaged the Transport and Harbors Department, which is the executing unit, the supervisory consultant, as well as the contractor on this project. There are a number of things that I wish to bring to your attention. Number one, I have ordered the contractor to get on with the job and I'm advised and I have seen some evidence that work has recommenced. The second thing that I need to bring to your attention is that the Audit Office of Guyana has also commenced a forensic audit of this project. And number three, there is a clear case of bad contract management. And this is not a singular project. It's not a singular project. One of the things that would have caused significant delays is the inability of the Transport and Harbors Department and the contractor to reconcile on one simple item in the contract, salvageable materials. Because the, the, the contract as written at that time envisaged that materials that could have been reused should have been reused. And there was this big debate about what could be reused and what could not be reused. And a contract was stalled. The people of Leguan suffering and a contractor twisting his thumbs and benefiting from a cash advance given from the state's coffers, doing nothing. By no means, this is the end of this matter because we will follow it as we go along. The Sheriff Mandela upgrade, the road, Sheriff Road widening and upgrade. Currently, all users of that road would recognize no work is going. This has been stalled. And it's not purely as a result of COVID-19. It is as a result of mismanagement of this project. 
And this seems to be the hallmark. Almost every project you go into, there are issues, there are problems, unresolved matters. And while the project is being stalled, the road is de deteriorating and there are issues. I have since instructed the supervisory consultant and the contractors to get on with this project. A new work plan should be provided and I have engaged the funding agency, the Inter-American Development Bank, as to all of the environmental issues and other issues that surrounded this project that caused it to be stalled and to stop the flows of money towards the project and we should see some movement on that. So we, in, we, we left in the pipeline when we departed government in 2015. This project, some of the money in, in, in the loan was diverted to be used for housing and some other matters. But even that which was allocated for the road was not being properly disbursed. The contract was not properly implemented and the cost is running up. Mismanagement again. The Linden Letham Road and the Kurupukari Crossing, which for five years almost, this Granger administration kept coming to the parliament for monies and you would have be reminded that during the debates we would have pointed out the only things that were happening were designs and you may recall me saying two jobs two jobs two jobs just before we got here minister Indar and myself along with our technical country team engaged a virtual meeting with the CDB and the technical people to come to final decision on the use of the 90 million pounds under the UK SIF and this road is a priority and we expect that the indecision and the lack of movement which obtained over the last several years would be resolved in a matter of weeks and we'll be getting on with the Linden to Letham Road. The East Coast, East, Bank, East, East Coast Road upgrade, the four lane, even though you had the beautiful pictures of a, uh, on the front page of a newspaper indicating that it was being opened, it had not even reached practical completion. So we had the photograph for the purpose of the election gimmicks, but this road is still to be completed. This road is still to comply with all of the contractual obligations of signs, traffic lights, and all the other things that needs to be done. And this is a work in progress and we are engaging on ensuring that it is completed. Pre-2015, before we left office, through a visit of President Ramatar at that time to India, we obtained the possibility of funding of $50 million to fund a bypass road from the East Coast to the East Bank. Over the last five years, no road. President Irfan Ali led a team that included myself and Minister Indar and the Vice President Barjadio with the Indian government. And I'm happy to report to the people of Guyana today, very shortly, the final arrangements on this road will be announced in less than 10 days 
of an Irfan Ali administration, a matter that was lying for years, not resolved, is being resolved. Out of that Indian line of credit, you would have also recall that $18 million was also available to build a ferry for Region 1. We came back into office. There's still no ferry. The only thing we met on our desk, disputes, indecision, lack of proper management and policy direction. And we are pleased to announce to you today that over the last 10 days of the Air Finale administration, working with the Indian High Commission, the people of Region 1 can expect their ferry within 18 months from this time because decision on this matter has been made and we are going forward. The new Demerara River crossing still continues to be high on our agenda. And I know the big issue for a lot of people are whether we will continue with the same location or are we landing at the next location or what will be the final design. Let me say very clearly, the Air Finale administration is committed to building a high-span, four-lane concrete bridge across the Demerara River. That is being pursued. All options are being looked at. The model for financing and the rest of it is being worked on. A plan for the development of interior roads and bridges are continuing and we have engaged the engineers for both urban and rural roads as well as hinterland roads and you will see in our 2020 budget accelerated movement in this regard. Just before I left the office, the permanent secretary and one of our key technical officers engaged me, and I will be bringing this matter to conclusion shortly, of how we will liquidate the debt of $200 million that the Ministry of Public Infrastructure then took from the asphalt plant of the Demerara Harbor Bridge during the January to June period. But when you look at the reality of the spending, it was all in preparation for elections 2020 to satisfy specific constituencies. The asphalt plant, we want it up and running. And we want both government and private contractors to be able to get access to that. The Demerara Harbor Bridge, as envisaged, we know that this is a aged bridge, and that's one of the reasons why we have indicated since 2015 and before, we did the pre-feasibility and all the rest of it for a new river crossing the general manager of the Demerara Harbor Bridge has indicated to me just this morning that we've had a failure of a winch which will affect the retraction of the bridge. So over the weekend, efforts will be made to have this matter resolved it will affect marine traffic at least for a day, maybe two days. 
but I've instructed him that once the work plan is worked out with the engineers, that adequate notice must be given to our users so that the necessary work on the Demerara Harbor Bridge at this weekend must be able to go forward. Minister Indar will address what I will want to call, if it is not the singular biggest issue that is affecting Guyanese at this time, which is electricity and GPL, and he will also make some other statements uh, before we take your questions. Minister Diodat Indar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Agil. Well, today, what I would like to do is to make clear with the citizens what we have inherited at the Guyana Power and Light. Um, what we have inherited is an institution that has only benefited on the five long years three caterpillar generating sets to the cost of about one million dollars one million u.s dollars that is the only amount that the coalition government saw fit as capital injection into gpl to enable more generating capacity as we are now residents throughout the country would be experiencing some level of power outages and the reason for that is because the peak demand as we speak it's around 117 megawatts and the capacity it's 117 to 120 megawatts the capacity of output so anytime there's an issue with any one of the generating sets throughout GPL's uh, substation systems at Garden of Eden, at Kingston, at Hoop, at Unverwatt. Anytime there's an issue with generator failures, system tripping, you will experience blackout. There are news that the 46.5 megawatt uh, station is being constructed at Garden of Eden. Just to be clear with the citizens, the civil works for that project, it's only 14% complete. And uh, that completion is tabled for April 2021. That is a long time out. The generators that were purchased, five of them in total, are still in Finland. They have not yet been transported um, on any ship bound for Guyana. So in the meantime, from now until the arrival of those generating sets and uh, the commissioning um, of them and hooking them up into the system, we are left with a state where the capacity that we have to generate power is equivalent to the demand. And any disruption in the system causes power outages. What we will do, as the Prime Minister said yesterday, we will issue an immediate expression of interest um, GPL will put that out for power producers in Guyana who do have immediate capacity to add to the grid. There are a few persons that are, has expressed interest, but we want it to go through a public process so that it will be transparent. We are evaluating the costs of those options. If we are to buy power from persons or entities that are producing them, or if we shall go and buy generators, new ones, that are uh, in Guyana, so that they can quickly be added to the system. I would just like to let you know also that there is a generator that was recently repaired by, the, uh, by PPDI, who is the company that is managing the generator sets, of 7 megawatts, and that should be added to the system within a couple of days. That will be able to boost capacity so that if there's any kind of um, failures in the system, that generator can be some level of backup power. 
In addition to that, there's another one for 5 megawatts that were introduced at Cane Field that can also add to the generating capacity. That being said, I would just like to say that a number of citizens are asking the question, if we are an oil and gas economy, why are we buying power? The, the, the issue is one that is of concern and it's of concern to our government, but the only thing that we have to take note of is the time to implementation. Any gas to power plant take at least four years minimum. So we have to put in place immediate measures, medium term measures and long term measures. And we want to make sure that we are transparent in that process. So that is on the issue of GPL. Coming back to the issue of Minister Edgel talk about with the sea defenses. As you would know, persons living on Esequibo and in quarantine, there are a number of places that we have that are what we call risky areas for breaches. But the most important one is in the Maikoni region, where the breach starts out very small, but if you don't re react quickly to, to, to a breach, it ends up escalating and costing more. And ministers quickly responded yesterday with my, myself in dealing with that. We understand this morning from the regional chairman of the area, there, there, there is flooding for some of the residents there. And um, we will obviously be going down there shortly um, to see what is the impact and how our government can assist. One of the things that we also did when we came into office on day one, we also met with the head of Marad. We want to say that the Irfanali administration is cognizant of the fact and the importance of the Maritime Department because the oil and gas industry is offshore and the Maritime Department plays an important role. And myself and Minister Agil will be going down shortly um, to meet with some of the operators um, that operate in, in the sector. As we, as we are there now, I would just like to, to stop um, and to ask if there are any questions for myself or Minister Edgel. Be, be, before we take um, questions, um, I would ask that if there are any questions as it relates to the, the breach at Maikoni and any questions on GPL, Minister Indar has been the person who have been on the ground, and even though I am fully briefed, I will defer those matters to him so you could ask your questions directly to him on those matters. Uh, just to say at the Marin time at Marad, there is going to be some amount of reorganizing at Marad and that reorganizing is to facilitate what Minister Indar spoke about. Marad as a regulator to ensure that we build capacity to answer to what is emerging in our new economy and that is something that is on the cards and it is something that is an active is is in is, is an active work for the persons using the Suriname ferry crossing we need to indicate that when we came to office we were briefed and based upon all indication at the Suriname at the Guyana end, sorry, we are prepared. Once clearance is given by the COVID task force and there is agreement with Suriname to start operating that service in a manner that is safe and in compliance with all of the COVID-19 guidelines and protocols. So, for those who are concerned about when that service will start, we will be guided both at the level of the task force and at the bilateral arrangement between ourselves and Suriname because both sides have to have the arrangements 
um, in, in, in place. So that is as it relates to the ferry service across. So we'll pause here and take your questions. Uh, Gordon uh, Mosley, News Source. Good, good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, sir, I realize, I realize you didn't say you much about, about uh, the Burbese River, River Bridge. Bridge. I know there I were know some there were issues with the company with wanting, wanting to raise the tolls, tolls on that bridge. On that bridge. Uh, could, uh, could you give us an give update on how the new government, government intends to address that issue? And Minister Indar, uh, the, uh, the uh, GPL, GPL problems, problems are not new. They would have existed up to 15 years ago. So when the PP left office in 2015, they knew what existed. Could you say what new plans, uh, short-term plans are being put in place to address the many concerns you have raised since those, those issues would have also existed uh, for the 23 years that uh, your party was in there overlooking GPL? You want to answer the question I answer GPL? All right, Gordon, thank you for asking. You would recall that the Borbies Bridge is not a government-owned bridge, but the government was involved. And you would recall that there is a legal case that happened under the last administration and at this stage while we are being briefed on all of the various sectors I am not able to definitively pronounce on all that we will do as it relates to the matters that emerged over the last five years and the court issues because those are matters that we have to read ourselves into get ourselves very brief and we'll be coming back to you with policy direction uh, on, on that matter at a later point so as it relates to the Barbies bridge that's where we're at no decision we are our administration that is two weeks and we're getting there Thank you, Gordon. So, you would recall as well, when the PPP was in power, that there was a project for the Amelia Falls, which is renewable energy. So, the administration then, prior to 2015, recognized the problem, as you rightly said, with fossil fuel generated power. That is why they made the proposal for a hydropower. The hydropower would have added 165 megawatts to the grid and that would have taken care of all of our problems at a, at a cost that is way below what for fossil fuel generated power is when the new government came in to shelve the project that project would have been able to deliver uh, energy to the, the grid at the end of 2018 we don't have it anymore so you're left and you're trapped with a fossil a fossil fuel generated system so immediate terms is as i said earlier is that we have to see what are the existing systems they have that can go into the grid right away, meaning within a, within a month. Then we also have to look if we're going to procure generators uh, in, in, as the immediate measures to alleviate this problem. It's a mess. I will say to you, it's a mess we inherited. So for us to get power immediately, we have to look at those two, those two short-term um, options. The one that goes for 2021, remember, 26.5 million U.S. was already expended towards Silla to buy those five generating sets. There's a balance to be paid, about $17 million remaining. But we are already, GPL has already signed a contract with Wartzilla. You cannot pull back on that right now. You have to go through with it. That 46.5 is going to take up your generating capacity to about 165 megawatts which will deal with the power um, capacity within 
eight months time, eight months, nine months time from now. Further to that, in the further out outlook, the gas to power plant is something that the vice president has been pushing for hard and uh, we intend to pursue that vigorously because it will be cheaper. It, it, in terms of speed of implementation, it will arrive, power can arrive on shore quickly, um, but that is like three, four years out. So we have to make sure the responses that we put in is in keeping with the current problems that we have and dealing with the reality of the situation. Thank you. Gordon, if I should just add to what my colleague have said, while other sectors would have reported, and more particularly the Vice President, would have spoken to the state of the Treasury that we would have inherited, most of what we inherited is also broken. So while the treasury is empty, the things that you would have thought would have been dealt with and fixed were neglected. For example, we have to find the money to make sure all the hinterland generators keep moving. 281 million. We have to find the money to keep GPL going because base load was not added in any significant way over five years. You got housing development in businesses coming on stream. Every end user requires more power. So it's not just maintaining, but it's adding base load. And any solution at GPL must not just be maintenance of generators, but we have to also add base load. So as it is right now, the Air Finale's administration wants to assure the Guyanese people that every intervention that is needed now to keep lights and power flowing is being made and at the adding of base load to cater for shortfall and trips uh, is being addressed in the medium term. But as it relates to the long term, we are going back to visit Amalia and its possibility for reliable, renewable, and cheap electricity and the use of our natural gas for the firing of generators to produce power is high on the agenda. So, like Minister said, we have to deal with what we met. We did not inherit a smooth GPL that is hunky-dory. You have seen what would have happened in 10 days. People have called me to say it's sabotage. People have called me to say all kinds of different things. But one of the things that we could all agree on is that what should have been done was not done, so neglect is a proper word to be used in the circumstances. Thank you. Uh, you said you met a, a system that was not smooth running, but did you leave one that was smooth running? Well, Gordon, I think one of the pride of the former Prime Minister, Samuel Hines, and his team would have been the interventions that were made from the time the PPPC came to office where we inherited no functioning grid or system. And you will remember the issue of the power barge that never really worked and all the rest of it. Prime Minister Hines worked to ensure those 20-year generators were actually functioning through a contract we had with Wartzilla, uh, as almost new, and they were reliable. And I must say, PPDI, which is local, and we have boasted about how we have taken away Wartzilla, and we have PPDI, they have been doing a great job. But the, the fact of the matter is, we still have to rely on Wartzilla for a lot of the spares, and the capacity to keep us going. So there are limitations. What we would have done was to answer 
that broken system and produce a reliable system in the center and expanded electricity supply to the hinterland communities and that's the generating sets that we were talking about and that's what we left we had practically solved the blockout issue Skeldon, once it was working was producing for the grid at least six megawatts of electricity we ensured that we had the demerara borbis interconnected system so if uh, kingston failed it didn't mean the whole system failed we connected garden of eden sophia kingston canfield we expanded the, the the distribution network by putting in substations on a loan that we were able to benefit we worked on the loss reduction program and energy efficiency to ensure that the generators that we had, the, the fuel that we were buying was low cost fuel and all the rest of it. So I know it was not perfect when we left, but remember, compare what we left as against what we inherited. And that is why we were going to Amala as, we, as, as a solution, not just to the short term, big capital investment for more generating sets, but we studied what would the capacity would have been. And like Minister Indar said, 165 megawatts would have been coming and it would have been in Georgetown and on the coastal connectivity by now, hadn't that program not been killed in the parliament. Any other questions? Bibi Katun here from the newsroom. Are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Okay. okay. Um, a clarification in relation to the flights that were approved for September and October. This includes both outgoing and repatriation flights. And can you say when the government is looking to reopen the airport for commercial flights and if any airline have so far applied to start back commercial flights? The flights that we are referring to are both inbound and outbound. As it relates to the reopening of the airport, there are a number of things that we have to consider. The commercial airlines have not yet said they are ready to start commercial operations. What we have currently are applications for charters. For example, Caribbean Airlines, Port of Spain is not open. That's the home of Caribbean Airlines. So right now, to even get Caribbean Airlines to do a flight, for the Toronto leg and to deal with some of the Guyanese in Toronto who want to come home and some of the Guyanese in Guyana who are also citizens of Toronto who want to get back home. Caribbean Airlines, I'm not sure they are ready to do that. The GCAA is in talks. So the engagement of WestJet and others is to get that kind of a operation going. But like I said, we are buying the mist tunnels, sorry. We are putting in place the possibility of rapid testing with a private sector initiative on arrival at the airport. We are putting in all of the international rec recommended WHO PAHO protocols for safe and sanitized movement within our airport. So it's a matter of us getting prepared and we believe two weeks based upon what i'm being told everything on our side would be ready but we are not sure that the commercial airlines will be ready so what we are doing is approving the charters to keep the movement of people in and out and because it's only charters the systems that we have in place right now are adequate to handle 
this kind of a traffic. But with commercial travel of three, four, five flights a day, uh, we will need additional things, and that's what we're putting in currently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in relation to the Danzig Sea Defense, you mentioned that um, the financial approval was given. Can you say how much was approved and how soon works will start there? And in relation to the solar panels, can you say which regions will benefit from them or which areas? Well, let me start with the work at Danzig. Um, there are a number of contractors that are working in that five kilometer stretch that is under con construction because of what we met when we came to office. The 100 meter stretch that broke yesterday is closer to where BK International is working. BK International has a contract to do work in a section of that five kilometers that was damaged before. So what I have agreed with the permanent secretary, since we had a contract that was already awarded to BK International and the monies were not all paid out. I think it was just about $105 million that was already paid from a $352 million contract. Monies from that contract will be used in an emergency manner to deal with this new 100-meter breach. And the reality is, because of how the sea defenses are situated, if, even if you wanted to put in a next contractor that is not currently mobilized on the site to do that emergency work, you're talking about an impossibility. So the instructions are to engage the contractor that is working currently to move to the emergency works so that we could bring relief immediately to the people of Myconi and the other surrounding areas and at the appropriate time with a budget and in a proper financial architecture we will have to make applications for the sums that are required to satisfy the, the contractual demands. The estimates for the fixing of that 100 meter breach as currently exists could be about 145 million dollars. And that's what we're looking at based upon the figures that they provided to me. Thank you. As it relates to where the units that we are thinking about for hinterland electrification, we are looking at all regions, uh, hinterland regions. So we are talking, you know, we would have distributed solar panels before, 13,000 plus, And we have left in the system another 6,000 which was not properly taken to those communities. We are moving from 65 watt sets to a minimum of 100 watts. And so that will mean with all of the accessories, batteries, inverters, and everything else, we are looking to give out that to all the hinterland regions, which will also take in some riverine communities that are not on the grid that are not on the national grid. And we are pr also proceeding with what we spoke about, about putting in the 3,000 watt uh, panels in at least 100 communities in the initial stage to provide power for internet connectivity, hubs for the people to use, possible power to the health center and schools that are all sometimes in the one centralized area in those communities. So apart from household power of upgrading from 65 watts to 100 watts, we are also looking at, in the first instance, to do 100, 3,000 watt systems for community centralized power for government buildings to ensure that the, 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 the internet as well as 
computer systems, phones, and everything are adequately charged and used, and more so because of COVID-19 and the restriction in movements. We have to get this. We don't know how long COVID is going to be with us to ensure distance learning and all the other things are being considered at this time. So it is not for one specific region. It is for all the hinterland regions uh, and Amerindian communities. And we're also looking at the riverine communities that are not on the grid. Okay, thank you. thank you. And finally, can you say who were the um, contractors working along with BK at the dancing sea defense front? Minister Indar okay. will give so, that information. So, in addition to what Minister Ajil just said to you, I would like you all to appreciate that the time to mobilization is a key element here. Because that 100 meters that Minister said in a couple of days can become 200, 300, 400 and it extends as the water keep gushing in into the, the, the river front, the ocean front. So to es stop the escalation, the speed to react is the most critical thing. That is why it was justified to have the contractor that was closest to the breach is actually walking distance from where they're working, and they already have the stones there, so it have been, it is the, the best and fastest option, at least to stop the flow of water coming in into the, um, into the inland, into residents' um, farmland and in the, the um, households. So that is why we made that decision to be the fastest person that could have reacted. A little more up in the place called Glacier Lost, which is not far from Content Myconi, is ANS Contracting. They also are dealing with another breach that is there a while now that they're trying to get fixed. So they have a piece of work that they're still doing there as well. But they're a little more up, um, going up to uh, further Barbies. But Danzig is a little more downward, um, where, where, they, where the, this new breach has now arrived. The names of the other contractors. Yeah, so the only one that we have there right next to the, um, the breach is ANS Contracting. From what I, when I was on the ground, that is who I saw. Thank you. Any other questions? Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon, Minister. It's Tamika Guyana from the Guyana Chronicle. Um, forgive me if any of my questions sound redundant because I had several technical issues with my connectivity and I was out for some of the um, press conference. Um, I don't know if you guys mentioned anything about the power producers agreement with Giftland. Um, is that still in effect? And can you say what is the price, the amount of electricity that is being fed into the system and at what price? Well, we have not gone there as yet. Um, right now, that Matt is currently being engaged with the Prime Minister and myself. Um, actually, this afternoon, we were supposed to be meeting with Mr. Bipat. Um, what I can tell you is a 2.5 megawatt system. Um, that is a capacity. The cost and so on has not yet been um, determined. As you know, I said earlier that we are going out to expressions of interest. And we'll take it from there, right? To see other power producers who may have additional um, capacity to add to the um, to, to the system. So I can't tell you anything further about costs and the other things because we are now engaging uh, Mr. Bipat. There is nothing currently added to the system um, from Mr. Bipat. Um, those things have to now be worked out if they are to be worked out. We are engaging Mr. Bipat currently. Okay, thank you. Thank Can you, you say, say what, is what is the status, the status with the solar, solar panel farm, farm in Mabaruma? Has that? I know that was down for a while. Is that back up and working? Well, I could tell you that the solar farm in Mabaruma is an example of what not to do as a government. Because I personally visited that location. It was there left abandoned and it was not even hooked 
into the grid. Mabaruma, as is with the solar farm, being present, is not benefiting from what the project of a solar farm said they will benefit from. So that is being reviewed on how we could ensure that the residents there get benefit. They, I would think that if you speak with the regional chairman or the mayor of Mabaruma or the regional chairman of the region, they can tell you what difficulties they have even with getting reliable power with the generators in Mabaruma as well as a solar farm in Mabaruma. Any other questions? Um, well, I'm Al Griffith from Age. Go ahead. I'm Al Griffith from the News. Um, good afternoon, ministers. You expressed your commitment to the um, furthering the modernization of the Shadi Jagan International Airport. Can you give a timeline on when works um, can expect it or could be completed? At this particular stage, ma'am, just yesterday evening, I had to engage the Commissioner General of the Guyana Revenue Authority. The contractor has performed so badly that the Guyana Revenue Authority had stopped granting concessions, which is duty-free concessions, to the contractor to bring goods into the country and were even exploring the possibility of garnishment because of what is owed by the contractor to the GRA. Because of us wanting to get on with the work, I engaged Mr. Stacia, who have responded favorably to my intervention and we are seeking to, to clear the obstacles and the hurdles to ensure that the contractor is not going to use that as an excuse. Because when the instructions are given, there must be no excuse. I'm going to be very strong and straight with this. This project has gone wrong. The contractor has not fulfilled his obligations. And the Granger administration did not provide the necessary policy guidelines to the technical people to ensure compliance with the contract. This is a project that you'll be hearing about more and more as we get deeper and deeper into it. So, Concerning when they would finish, they should have finished since the 31st of December 2018. I am in no mode of extending timelines. We are in liquidated damages period of 700 and something days. So we got problems. And what we are seeking to do is to ensure delivery. So I am unable to give you a timeline. Uh, we have heard all of the excuses about COVID-19 and some of the people who went home for Christmas, they can't get flights to come back. But you would have seen earlier, I said we have approved flights for all of September, all of October, because a lot of technical people need to get in the country to keep some things moving. So we are clearing the obstacles and the excuses to make sure that there's proper project management and movement, not only in the CGIA, but on the Sheriff Mandela, the East Coast Four Lane, wherever works are ongoing, that we must be able to, to, to get things moving. So at a more appropriate time when we are able to engage all of the players and get a revised work plan, and that we could hold them accountable to, we will make that public. So thank you very much, 
ladies and gentlemen of the media, my colleague, Minister Indar, and myself, we remain open, accessible, and available to answer questions even outside of a press conference so that the public at all times could be informed and we look forward to benefiting from feedback from the public as we implement our program and agenda in keeping with the Irfan Ali's administration commitments. Thank you very much and God bless you all. Thank you.